So we're ready when you are. Yes, ma'am. So again, good morning, everybody. Um, if you could, I'd like to start this day off with a, a moment of prayer. Most heavenly gracious Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together as humble servants to your word and to your will, to worship and give glory to you, to give you honor and to expound upon your word, which is the gift in which you have given us to guide us through our days. Father, you know what's in our hearts for when we pray and we implore of you that you hear our cries and that you be there with us and for us as you are each and every day. Father, we thank you for being our God and being a prayer answering God. And most heavenly gracious Father, we ask that you can keep us safe. We thank you for the safe travels to here. And we ask that you be with us on our travels back home. And as we travel around this creation of yours to show your glory to those around us in darkness. Cover us with the blood of your son that we may be seen righteous in your eyes and guide and guard our actions to be pleasing in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's always an honor to be here to speak with all of you and especially to be, to be asked to um, help lead today in a, in a bit of worship. I wanna focus on God's word. You know, the Bible, it's not just a history lesson or a rule book. It's actually a centuries old war manual because we are in a spiritual war. We as believers are peace officers in God's army. The book of Ephesians tells us in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now, from there, it goes on to describe the different pieces of armor. There's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet being prepared to spread the gospel, the sword of faith, the helmet of salvation, or excuse me, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Then it emphasizes the importance of prayer in being outspoken for the gospel, to speak boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. Now keep in mind, Paul wrote this in Ephesus while being locked in a Roman prison. That's pretty bold. If we focus on the sword of the spirit, this is our weapon against the devil, the principalities of darkness with which we struggle against. The war that we are all embroiled in is a very real one, and we feel it. It's a battle for our mind, for our hearts, for our soul, a battle for truth. Jesus tells us that he is the truth, the way, and the life, and there is no salvation without him. The devil will attack our heart because it is an easy target to change our minds. Doubt can creep in and cause us to defeat ourselves. The ultimate prize of this war, your personal battle, is your soul. The battle for the mind because the mind is a battlefield. The mind dictates the physical actions of every person. Whatever a person does physically, they've already concluded it in their mind. The power of the mind is a great asset, and you merely need to look at the vast amounts of technology and architecture around us today to see this. Our enemy also knows the power of our minds, and this is why he is constantly trying to be enthroned in our heads. We do not want the devil to live rent-free. If he gets our minds, he then can control our lives. Proverbs 4.23 Solomon says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Our minds must be guarded at all times, otherwise we allow evil to creep into it and ruin our lives. The words and actions of a person are the greatest measure of the condition of their heart. Jesus says this in Matthew 12, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
The devil was good at arranging situations which allow him to gain access to our minds and our hearts. Sometimes the circumstances are pleasurable while others are challenging. He won over the heart of Solomon with pleasures and lust, but surrounded Job with evil and painful circumstances, all with the intentions of gaining access to their mind. Job was a man that prospered but lost all that he had cherished in a single day. His wealth, his health, his children, all was lost in a single day. The pain that Job suffered so that his mind would be taken off of God. But unlike Solomon, Job guarded his heart. Even when the devil caused his wife and asked him to curse God. Job's mind stayed on God and the devil failed over Job's life. He refused to curse God with his lips. Nothing just happens. The devil was trying to scare, frustrate, and stress all of us to the point where we blame God. He wants us to take away our ability to serve the Lord. And Romans says that with the mind, we serve the Lord. The devil knows the significance of our mind. Therefore, he goes after it any way that he can. We can overcome him by taking our stand for God. God has already won. Therefore, we don't need to fight. We merely need to stand our ground. God the Father is our fortress and our deliverer. Romans 12 shows us a way to guard our mind and to be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how do we renew our mind? First, it's with the blood of Christ, our salvation, our faith. But then it will be with the word of God. First, Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because our adversary, the devil, as a roaming lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast. We don't know enough about our enemy, the devil his tactics, his operation. In all honesty, I don't know how anybody could expect to stand against an enemy that they do not know. One of the greatest tricks the devil pulls is convincing people that he does not exist. But there is a real, living, walking, talking devil, and he is subtle. He is very successful. When he can convince people he doesn't exist, especially when we blame others for his work in our lives. Just because we might not see him with our physical eyes does not mean that he's not watching you. He is a very real enemy. But why is he watching me, you ask? It's because God is watching you and loves you. Whether you believe in him or not, regardless of any sin or evil deed you may have committed, God loves you personally, just as you are. No matter how holy or unholy you are, God loves you. His love for you is perfect and consistent. The devil knows this. This is why he will do anything in his power to capture you in sin, in doubt, to destroy your marriage, your finances, your home. He will not stop at stealing the peace from your life. The only way he can attack God is by attacking what God's love, God loves, which is you. He never gives up despite how high you are in your Christian experience, no matter how filled with the Holy Spirit you may be, you will never reach a point where the devil will give up on attacking you. Quite the contrary, the closer to God that you get, the larger the target is painted upon you. This is why we need our armor of God. One very brutal tactic used against us in this spiritual battle is that he attacks us when it's dark. And I don't mean after sunset and nighttime. I'm speaking of the night of tough seasons and during our weakest moments in our lives. I said earlier that the devil works through our mind. He puts thoughts and suggestions into our mind. He is smart. He knows that as a man thinketh his heart is so, so is he. So he works through our mind. Do you see kind of where I'm heading with this? 
He always attacks you at your weakest point. He wants to sow doubt into your heart. He wants you to feel isolated and alone. I like to use Christ as an example. Matthew, it tells us that Christ had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards, when he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones turn to bread. He hit him when he was physically weakened. Imagine how Jesus felt after 40 days of fasting. I mean, I can't even go four hours without eating. At that point is when the devil attacked, when he thought that he would most likely to give in. That is when he said, now turn these stones to bread. The devil doesn't fight fair. He'll always come at you in your darkest hour, your weakest point. When you're struggling with bills, boom, there's another one. Just to add to the load. It's when the devil attacks you and tells you that you have to quit. When you're struggling with your health, other things come at you. When your feds come banging on your door, to take away your loved ones. More adversity will come and hit. You've had a bad day at work. You come home angry, frustrated, and tired, and so does your spouse, and then boom, an argument. This is when the devil attacks you. He throws thoughts into your mind. Maybe this isn't working. This isn't worth it. I'm done. I give up. I don't want to live like this anymore. He hits you at your weakest point because he doesn't want you to fight back. Therefore, submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you, is what Paul tells us in James. It says nowhere in the Bible that we are to run from the devil. The Bible says resist and he will flee from you. Yet people spend most of their lives running from him. He raises his head and we move to another location. We hide in a corner. We look for a new church. We give up. God has given us the exaltation to fight. Resist means to fight back. And unfortunately, I see when people get hit one time by the devil's schemes and they lay down. They get hit a second time and they give up. They don't fight back. Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe God is punishing me. I'll never accomplish my goals. My loved ones will never be saved. I'm not good enough. Fight back. Too many people fail not because they don't love God, but because they give up too easily. Not because they don't pray or read the Bible, because they don't apply it steadfast in their mind. Resist, and he will flee from you. The Bible doesn't say pray, and I'll keep the devil from you. We pray to God in times of need and struggle, which is good. It, it opens up a, a direct line to God, and the Holy Spirit goes before you in your fight. But after that, you cannot just lie down and accept defeat. That is the time to stand. Stand your ground. There is no shortcut to this. You must resist the devil in Jesus' name. You should look to the example given in Matthew chapter 4. Look to the example that Christ, Lord of Lord, King of Kings, has given us. What did he do when the devil came to him face to face? Jesus didn't snap his fingers and destroy the devil or show the devil his divine glory because we cannot do that. Jesus did not command the devil to be gone because we cannot do that. Jesus did something that everyone here can do. I want you to remember this. Out of anything else that I'm going to say today, Jesus told the devil, it is written. It is written. In other words, Jesus went to the book and came out with scripture. Romans tells us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Hit him. It is written. Hit him hard. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. It is written. 
my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It is written, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Take out your sword and stand against the wiles of the devil the word, with the word of God. Resist and he will flee from you. God has a plan for you. Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. The Lord will watch your comings and your goings, both now and forevermore. The Lord will work the evil in your life to be good. No matter what the enemy decides to use against you, Isaiah says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God will use it as an advantage for his plan. Genesis, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. You only have to not give up. The problem is that too many people, they don't realize that they're in the middle of a battle. They don't put on their armor. They don't use the weapons given to us by God. They think stuff just happens. They're unlucky. Where in the Bible does it mention luck? It doesn't. Whatever you may be facing today that was sent out against you. The wiles of the enemy are taking those that we love. Don't let the devil defeat you or catch you unaware. Our lives may be crumbling, finances failing, marriages falling, justice not coming from man. Emotions can be overwhelming and get out of control. Quite frankly, many of us are losing our minds now. Struggling just to keep it together. You're not alone. Trouble comes at you from every angle. The enemy comes at you like a flood. I thank God for Isaiah 59, 19. He says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. This means that whatever comes your way, God will counter that attack and help you keep your peace. Whatever the day throws at you, the Holy Spirit will give you the power to overcome it. As your day is, so shall your strength be. So stand and fight. That means that God already knows what that day is going to throw you, and he has already poured out the strength that you will need to get through it. Just stand with him. Fight to grow your faith in God. Fight for the ability to walk by faith, not by sight. Fight for what is told in 1 Corinthians, that your faith should not stand on the wisdom of men, but of the power of God alone. We can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. We have gone too far now to turn back. God has taken you through too much just to leave you high and dry now. When you are sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired, and those that believed in you have left you, those that you loved have been taken, those that you depend on don't believe in you anymore. When they have lost hope in you or lost faith in you, be resilient. When David went to fight Goliath, everyone around him had given up. David did not give up because he knew that God was on his side. The same God that was behind David's slingshot is behind you as well. God is for you. So who can be against you? With God, all things are possible. Do not give up on what God has planned. Greater is he that is in me that is in the world. In all things, I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. No one escapes the burdens of life. Go to the word and enable yourself to know how to fight, how to stand with God. Put on the full armor of God and fight the good fight of faith. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The struggle that many of us are in, the reason that we're all gathered together is because we are being attacked from all sides. 
the country we love, the institutions we were raised to trust, the devil was now using to attack us. But I want to remind you of a story in the book of Daniel. It's a story of three men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In that time, they had been captured and taken by an evil king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And that evil king made a law that every time music played, they were to bow and worship him. Those three men refused. And when the king took them into captivity, he said, if you do not bow to me, I will punish you to death by throwing you into a furnace to burn alive. This is reminiscent of the struggle that we are in today with our country, our loved ones. We have been taken captive. We are refusing to bow to tyranny, to worship at the altar of Baal. And we have been threatened. We are being thrown into the furnace. Everything around us is burning. But when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into that fire, Nebuchadnezzar looked down to watch them burn, and he saw a fourth man standing in the flames with him. That fourth man is who we understand to be God, to be Christ. This enraged Nebuchadnezzar, and he ordered his men to stoke the furnace to such a level that the flames actually killed those that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into that furnace. And eventually, they all three walked out unharmed, unsinged. They did not even smell like the smoke of the flame. This drove Nebuchadnezzar crazy. He ran off into the woods and eventually became a believer himself. We don't need to fight. We need to stand our ground and say we bow to no man, but only to God. We will never bow to tyranny. And we understand that no matter what comes our way, it is in God's will. So trust in him. Though he slay me, I will trust in the name of the Lord. This is how we can restore our freedom. This is how we can restore our peace. This is how we can restore those that we are begging to be released from this tyrannical grip because we bow to no man the brandon administration ain't got nothing on we the people because we're americans and it's going to stay that way we have championed over the centuries dealing with adversity hardship tragedy and when we all have banded together stood in our faith and believing in our freedoms and our American values against the face of opposition. We have helped make this Amer great country the beautiful experiment that it is. When a tornado wipes out a town, the cities around them band together to help them rebuild. That tornado has a name and it is injustice. So we can all band together, knowing that God goes before us in this battle, and he will prepare a table in the, for us in the face of our enemies. Be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hold on to that faith and that trust. God did not spare them from the furnace. They got thrown in that furnace because when they walked out unharmed and victorious, it gave great glory to God and those that were trying to cause their demise could not deny the hand of God at work in their success and in their survival you are cherished by our creator just as you are and he goes before you accept him hold on to that trust and that faith I would like to take a moment to, to pray to wrap this up. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for hearing our hearts. 
for being with us to give us that what we need. Father, we ask that you be with us as we go about our days. In our times of struggle, in our times of pain, in our times of weakness, to help hold us up, to stand for our actions, our words, and our minds to be focused on you. Father, we ask that you soften the hearts of our enemies, that they may be brought to you and in your glory. Father, we ask that your will be done and that we can find the resolve with one another to be held within your bosom, knowing the safety and the peace which only you can provide. Heavenly Father, we ask that you lay peace upon the hearts of those that are struggling right now. Those that cannot see an end to this pain, show them the hope of your grace. Father, let us grow together in unity with one another to be the bulwark that we need to stand in this fight. The fight for truth, fight for justice, the fight for freedom are all fights for you, for your glory, for your son is the truth. Our faith and our freedom are the greatest gifts in which you have given us next to our salvation, which is true spiritual freedom, the freedom to have a direct line with you. Hear our cries, O Lord, and be with us as we walk this field to prepare a table for us in the face of our enemies that we may one again commune together with those that we love. And in Jesus' most holy and precious name, we give all honor and glory to you. Amen. Thank you, folks. God bless you all, and I hope that you enjoy a very blessed Sunday and safe travels to whichever part of this beautiful nation on which you will return.